Now we are discussing about the prerequisites for a marriage, and as uh, stressing upon that, Vivaha samskara, Vanaprastha samskara, and Sanyasa samskara. These three samskaras are not compulsory. They depend upon certain prerequisites. If those prerequisites are satisfied, yes, these samskaras can be given. Those prerequisites are not satisfied. They are not eligible for receiving those samskaras. That is Vivaha, Vanaprastha, and Sanyasa. So, discussing about the prerequisites of uh, a marriage. One thing that is uh, the age. In fact, instead of age, you should have understood as the proper development of hormonal and reproductive organs in the persons. So, it varies a little between uh, male and female. So, depending on that, generally, generally, uh, it has been understood as uh, 18 as a marriageable age for a girl and 21 for a uh, boy, for a youth and young man. So, this is the basic things that we are discussing. Then the other very important thing is, as I was telling, marriage, that is Vivaha, is taking upon us certain special responsibilities. So, now to take certain special responsibilities, we should be aware of what they are. Unless we know what they are and how we have to discharge those duties, there is no meaning in getting into wedlock, into your samskara or vanaprasa or sannyasa. In particular here, your samskara. We should be aware of our responsibilities. Now, one such uh, a remark is made in uh, Ramayana and as well as in Mahabharata. So you can just uh, note down if you like, that is Chaturnam Ashramanam hi Chaturnam Ashramanam hi Garhasthyam Shreshtham Uttamam Chaturnam Ashramanam hi Garhasthyam Shreshtham Uttamam <coughs> Hmm. Hmm. Ah, there is another uh, uh, there is another uh, uh, version of it. Chaturnam Ashamanam hi Mulam Sheshtamuttama. Garhastyam Mulam Sheshtamuttama. That's another version. Mulam Sheshtamuttama. So it's in a very simple Sanskrit and understandable as it is. Then another one is there. Yatha Matarama Shritya. Yatha Matarama Shritya. Yatha Matarama Shritya. Sarve Jeevanti Jantavaha. Sarve Jeevanti Jantavaha. Tatha Garhastya Mashritya Tatha Garhastya Mashritya Vartante Itar Ashramaha Vartante Itar Ashramaha Vartante Itar Ashramaha Vartante Itar Ashramaha in the first one it says, among the four ashramas, <coughs> the one which is fundamental, which is at the base, and which is the best ashrama, is the Grihastha ashrama. And in the second uh, quotation it says, every child depends on his mother. In the same way, all the other three ashramas depend on Grihastha ashrama. Now a little explanation about the ashrama system what you find in the Vedas. It's very simple to understand that is there are different phases of life. The very first phase of life is for learning because we are new to this world, we don't know what is what, we gradually explore what this world is and understand the principles, the rules and regulations, the laws and everything. It's a phase of learning. So that phase of learning is called as Brahmacharya Ashrama. Brahma is knowledge. Brahmacharya Ashrama. 
as the first phase. Then the second phase is this Grihastha Ashrama. And the third phase is Vanaprastha Ashrama. Fourth phase is Sanyasa Ashrama. Now here, Brahmacharya Ashrama is compulsory for everyone, irrespective of caste, creed, gender, race, whatever it is, no discrimination whatsoever. 100% it is compulsory for every living being, Brahmacharya Ashrama. Then as I was telling, Vanaprastha, Sanyasa and Grihastha, uh, they depend upon prerequisites. If those requisites are satisfied, yes, they can get into Grastha Shama, Vana Prastha Shama, Arsanya Shama. It is subject to condition. If those conditions are not satisfied, no, they are not eligible for it. So among these four phases, Grastha Shama is the one which takes care of the other ashramas, that is Brahmacharya, Vanaprasa and Sanyasa, as a mother takes care of the child. So it is at that position. It takes care of the other three ashramas. Etha Mataram Ashritya Sarve Jeevanti Jantavaha As all creatures take shelter and the mother and the mother takes care of the children in the same way. Tatha Garhastya Mashritya Vartante Itarashamaha. So other ashramas, that is Brahmacharya, Vanaprastha and Sanyasa, they are taken care of by Grasthashama. That is those who are in the Grasthashama. Now this point we have to remember because in future I one back once again I come back to this reference. So this Grihastha Shama is taking upon a certain special responsibilities. So what are those responsibilities? Those who are getting into this wedlock, they should be aware of. Okay, we are taking upon ourselves these responsibilities. These are the responsibilities, you are aware of it. And how to discharge those responsibilities, we know it and are going to do it. So only with that knowledge, they have to get into this Grahasthashama. And getting into Grahasthashama is what is called as Viva Samskara. So once they get this Viva Samskara, they are into Grahasthashama. So that they should be aware of. Among those responsibilities, one special responsibility is there, that is to beget children. To propitiate, that is to continue the generation. Now this is a very very important responsibility and how to bear a child, how to take care of it and how to train it, how to make that child a worthy citizen of the world. Now that's a responsibility. As parents they should be able to know the different things involved in this. If they are not aware of it, Okay, physical relationship will be there, the child will be born, but they will not be in a position to train the child, develop the child into a useful citizen of the world. They fail. So they are failing this task. The children become irresponsible, the children become fools, the children become a burden on the whole world. So that should not happen. It's a responsibility of every parent, not only to beget a child, but make the child a worthy citizen, a noble citizen of the world. Only when they know how to do it, only when they know how to achieve that task, yes, they are eligible to get into Grahasthashana. Otherwise, no. This is another one. Then, another responsibility they are taking upon is, to take care of the Brahmacharya Ashrama, Vanaprastha Ashrama and Sanyasa Ashrama. So to take care of the other three Ashramas, 
they should be quite affluent they should have sufficient resources only when with the help of those resources they can take care of the brahmacharya vana prasan sanyasa ashrama not otherwise and as a resources it doesn't mean only money of course money is one of it it could be so many resources including money so they should be able to generate hold on to and distribute to the other three ashramas as and when required in what proportion it is required so it becomes their responsibility that means they are the bread earners in the society all the earning element is not there in brahmacharya ashrama or vana prastha or sanyasa the earning element is there only in grihastha ashrama so to earn that to create resources that to maintain resources that to be resourceful in all respects they should be affluent and whatever they have got they have to share with the other three and see that the other three ashramas also run smoothly that becomes a responsibility <clears throat> they have started their spiritual journey in the brahmacharya ashrama the orientation is slightly different there it is learning learning and learning full time of course that learning what has been started in brahmacharya ashrama continues till the last breath that learning element will not go but the orientation will change a little so it comes to grihastha ashrama they are applying them practically so whatever they have learned in brahmacharya ashrama how to apply it in real life practically they should be aware of that's also a prerequisite and in the duplication they should be able to handle the resources around them safeguard them enrich them protect them share them all these things are required now they should be aware of all these things they got responsibilities to be discharged towards brahmacharya ashrama vana prastha sanya towards the society towards their children and more than all all the husband and wife the husband and wife also has to be with me now the relationship between husband now the relationship between husband and wife neither bagini mute hello yeah ah it's done now they have to pursue their spiritual journey also there is another uh, process because i have been telling time and again that human life is for spiritual upliftment If their spiritual upliftment is not there if their spiritual pursuit is not there there is no difference between the life of an animal or the life of a human being this i have been stressing again and again so even that spiritual pursuit should continue but the way it continues in brahmacharya ashrama the way it has to continue in grihastha ashrama one percent and yes they are all different so they should be aware of how to continue this spiritual journey in grihastha ashrama very important thing is in grihastha ashrama it is a joint venture both husband and wife work together for discharging all their special responsibilities that they have taken upon them in addition to it in addition to it they are pursuing their spiritual goal also together that each one of them will assist will help will guide one another in their spiritual pursuit now this is a very very important thing in the spiritual pursuit angle or element if it is not there in grihastha ashrama then the husband and wife in their life they become totally animal like totally animal like and they are concentrating only on their sensual pleasures they cannot go ahead 
Now it is this spiritual pursuit and goal and working together for it. Will have a control on their sensual pleasures and makes it healthy and enjoy it in reasonable doses. And that is not there, it becomes uncontrollable and finally it may land both of them in a lot of problems and difficulties. To achieve this, they have to understand one another well. Now understanding one another well, it starts in two levels. Number one, before marriage. Another one, after marriage. Maximum understanding of one another will happen only after marriage. But before marriage, before marriage, they have to attempt as much as possible to understand one another. Now here, we have got another, uh, this is a cultural difference, what we find in the Vedic society or where uh, Vedas are uh, respected and in other societies. Here, they call it as courtship, courtship period. Whereas elsewhere, they call it as dating. Now there is a lot of difference between the two. In courtship, of course, they spend some time together and try to understand one another and there will no, there will be no physical relationship. It's very clear. They maintain that distance. That's the courtship period. Whereas in dating, such restrictions are not there. If I'm right, yes. That is, they go together, they discuss, they try to understand, and most of the time, most of the time during dating, they will have their physical relationship also. That restriction is not there. Or that is a culture elsewhere. But the physical relationship, as I was telling, has to be restricted to one person. One person. That is one man to one wife and one wife to one man. Because that is the base for their spiritual journey. That's a very important thing. For the spiritual journey, they have to understand one another well and both of them have to build a bridge between them. So this can happen only if it is one to one, if it is one to many, bridging of all those things, building so many bridges will finally result in no bridge being completed. And that's the problem. We have to concentrate all our faculties, all our energies into one. So that is why they insist always that there has to be a one to one relationship. One to many, it is natural in animal life, that's okay. But in human life, it's not, because it's not just physical dimension that is there. There's physical, there's mental, and there's a spiritual also. All the three dimensions are peculiar and special and unique for a human relationship. So that we have to bear in mind. So here we definitely accept what is known as courtship. In that courtship, they sit together, discuss, and they're sitting together and discussing, trying to understand. It is all open. It is all open. So everyone should be able to know what they are doing. They never get into a closed room. It's a very important thing in courtship. Whereas, in dating, such restrictions are not there. Okay, they move together, they go anywhere, they spend their time anywhere. It need not be open, it could be secret also. So many things are there. Now this may cause, may cause a lot of problems in future. It's a very important thing. And as a result of their physical relationship, so many things may happen even before marriage. Bearing of a child should have been after marriage. That is with mutual understanding and responsibility and mutual relationship between the two as man and wife. Only then the responsibility about the child they can take care of. Not otherwise. So, without such preparations, just because of physical relationship, something happens, then that two people who are involved in it, they may not be able to take care of the child and maybe if they don't want the child, they may even go for aborting it. So many such things. Yes, that's what we are observing in different societies. And as for some statistics, what uh, we have seen, it says that more than eight 80% of the people 
have gone for dating would have gone into one or two abortions, more than 80%. As a result of this, it hinders, it comes in the way of the spiritual journey, that's the problem. And spiritual journey, spiritual pursuit is the goal of the human life. So you have to take care of it, you have to take care of it. Now dating has to be converted into courtship and it is open and transparent. Yes, we try to understand, okay, we are planning to get into Vivaha, Vivaha Samskara and we are planning to live together, how far we are compatible to one another. How are our attitudes, how are our aptitudes, how are our habits, what are our goals, so many things, excellent, we have to discuss. Because discussing all these things after marriage, now here another very important thing. In this Vivaha Samskara, they insist on, I repeat, they insist on their relationship till the end. There is no question of, there is no conception of divorce. That concept itself is not there. It is coming together and leading life till the end together. There is no question of divorce. But if you don't consider whether our attitudes and attitudes, whether they match or not, if we get into the Viva Samskara, then we cannot divorce, we cannot live together. So that will be the condition. That is either we will be that way or we will be this way. And the whole life will be a lot of trouble, a lot of repentance and so many things. So the final answer, what they find for it is, okay, we cannot get together, okay, we will divorce. But this concept of divorce, when it is abolished, then the courtship period becomes very important and they have to understand one another very well even before getting into your samskara. That opportunity is there. That opportunity is there. But unfortunately, in the present day society, on the one extreme, it is dating. On the other extreme, they say, no, you should not talk even before marriage. We elders will take care of it. Now this is another extreme. The responsibility of understanding one another of course, the elders are there to guide, I am not denying it, but the main major responsibility is on the bride and the groom. They have to take their own decision, they have to discuss and finally come to an understanding. Now here in India, this is not appreciated very much. And the parameters for deciding a marriage, they have become totally different. They go for caste. So the match the cast, matching of cast doesn't mean matching of minds. These two things are totally different. And they go for another uh, very unscientific thing that is <laughs> measuring whether the compatibility is there with the help of pieces of paper, what they call it is horoscope. Horoscope. This horoscope is to one extent scientific. That is, as long as the astronomical things are there in that. Beyond astronomical things, if they shift it to astrological things, yes, it is unscientific and foolish. Vedas never speak of astrology, they speak of only astronomy. And other things, they speak of psychology and spiritual pursuits and other things. They never speak of astrology and they never speak that if the sun or moon or some such thing is in such a house and in the horoscope of the girl in such a house they make a good pair all those things are not statistically proved statistically proved is just their belief and not belief in truth or science so they have got that horoscope as one of the parameters to match they have got this caste as one of the parameters. They have got their financial status, their so-called educational status, they have got so many parameters. But they miss the whole crux of it. That is the matching of the attitudes, the aptitudes, goals in life, habits, health. They miss all these things. It's very unfortunate. Because of that only, because of that only, the incidence of divorces are more. If you take care of these things in the beginning, yes, the case of divorces will be very minimal or will not be there at all. Now, all these things you have to consider and discuss before getting into that Vivaha Samskara. So, that period of courtship is very important. Okay, on the face of it, 
the bride and groom say that okay this person would may be my life companion would be a companion for my life to further ensure it they go for this courtship period they spend some time together but in a very transparent way in open way and there is no secrecy and there is no physical relationship i stress upon it just they sit down and discuss i would so many things to understand one another their outlook to life and so many things and if it all matches then say okay we are ready we can get into wedlock one more thing is to be understood here 100% compatibility between bride and groom will never happen 100% there will be differences even after all this discussion even after all this study even after all this studying about their attitudes and aptitudes that difference will always be there that is why he said after marriage it is bridging it is bridging it is to come closer to understand one another and to bear with one another with all their positives and negatives every person will have certain positive things every person will have certain negative things the whole question is to what extent we can tolerate the negative things of each other now that makes a family life successful that's a very important thing so discuss all those things and at the end of the courtship they say okay so many things are compatible so many things match and there are certain things we do not match and we are confident that those things we can tolerate and continue still we can be good companions okay at the end of that yes they are given this we all have some skara they are given lot of knowledge what they have to practice in the grihastashram of course the detail aspects would have been told in the brahmacharya ashrama during their education in the gurukula so this all set on pre requisite now honestly most of us here we are all married and we have got that vivah samskara did we really go through all these stages honestly speaking the answer is happened that's all maybe certain things we have seen but not to this depth so that's a problem that's a problem at least at least now we know what they are now at least we should be able to practice it and implement it and tell our children okay this is like this is like this it should happen and that will ensure your future happiness to ensure your future happiness these are the prerequisites now in later win in later win uh at the time of my marriage mm. <laughs> believe it or not i interviewed nearly 75 girls and none was suitable wow. and my wife is a 76th one <laughs> <laughs> so that was the big exercise we were into it's not that i knew everything but at least i knew a few of these things because of my parents and teachers and i wanted to implement it and uh, of course after so much of trouble uh, today i am very comfortable and happy and peaceful with my wife <laughs> uh, uh, of course it's just in light rain about my self i told it could be the case with all of you also and we are uh, really if i am uh, permitted to use that word we are really lucky to have such partners yes that's there but what about other cases what about other cases we want to make every family as peaceful and as loving as it is for that purpose yes we have to take care of all these things we have to educate our children about their present life about their future life about their responsibilities in different phases of life and how to evaluate it in particular evaluate a person who we are going to take as companion for life there are so many things this is all the prerequisites unless we cover up all these prerequisites they are not eligible for it then health i was telling you, health is another very important thing now here when i am speaking of this health there are uh, several uh, uh, angles for it to look at it one is the capacity to reproduce so their hormonal things has to be in such a way that they should be able to beget children but that's not the only one that's one of the prerequisites regarding health then another very important thing is every one of us will carry certain hereditary deficiencies hereditary deficiencies knowing or not we have got it from our uh, 
genealogy from our parents and grandparents and so many things. Now we should be able to identify what are those defects, what are those shortcomings. And after studying those shortcomings, we have to analyze them into two. That which passes on to the next generation, hereditary deficiencies. Of course, when I speak of hereditary deficiencies, we should also understand there are some hereditary positive things also. Fine. So negative things, I'm very particular about it. So if there are anything which will get passed on to the next generation, we should block it. Otherwise, those hereditary deficiencies will pass on to the next generation and they will be troubled. A few examples. Say if there is a diabetes, diabetes prone tendency, diabetic tendency is there in the parents and the grandparents and in us. Our children also will have a tendency of the probability they also getting diabetes is more. Of course, it's very clear when you're speaking of AIDS. If the parents have got AIDS, the chances of the children getting the same AIDS is very high. Just two examples. There are like that. There are so many things which pass on from generation, which are hereditary. So those factors which are hereditary, really negative things, we have to take care of. Otherwise, we are propagating that negative deficiency to our next generation also. So as far as possible, we have to block it. Otherwise, if we pass on those deficiencies to our children, we will not be generating, but will be degenerating. That is the next population, that is the next generation, becomes weaker and weaker. But our purpose is not making the next generation weaker and weaker, but to make it stronger and stronger. That is proper evaluation. Proper evolution, I mean, proper evolution. We have to progress. We have to become stronger and stronger. And that is one of the purposes of this Vivaha Samskara. That also we have to understand. One of the purposes of Vivaha Samskara is to beget a progeny which is better than us. So in this case, we have to keep an eye on all the deficiencies, all the negative things, which may be hereditary, which may not be hereditary. If the hereditary problems are very much, yes, we request them not to go for begetting children. If they want, okay, husband and wife, they can live together, they can live their life happily, but we advise them not to have children because the negative deficiencies will pass on to them. We tell them, okay, you are not eligible to bear children, you are eligible to marry. Like this, regarding health, we have to see mainly these hereditary factors which will be passed on or not. If there are some health deficiencies, okay, once again, how much we can overcome them, overcome them. It's possible to overcome, yes, we shall overcome them and then have children. It's not possible to overcome them, okay, we will suffer, we will hold it for ourselves and we will not pass it on to the next generation. So these are the responsibilities of the parents, they have to think in all those angles. Now this is a prerequisite, health is a prerequisite. Now many times what happens is, if they are transparent and open regarding their health condition, most of the time the marriages itself will not take place. Because they say, oh you have got so many defects, I don't want to have you as your companion. Now because of this fear, most of the time what they do is, they suppress and they are not open regarding their health condition. Now because of that, whatever they have kept it as a secret, after we are samskara, when they come closer, definitely it will be out. Then the relationship between the two will suffer. So it's better, we, should, we are open, we are frank and transparent in all these things. Now there is one uh, suggestion which I usually give. Instead of matching the two horoscopes, you match their health records, that will be better. So you should match their health records, not horoscope. If they match the health records, they can make a happy living. They can lead a happy life. But if you match horoscopes, nothing is ensured. It is very unscientific. Now when I say health records, it also includes, it also includes the blood groups. 
and you speak of blood groups also there are some matchings and there are not some matchings so if the parents have got the parents have got a negative blood group so just for an example i am telling the property of children also getting negative blood group is very much and is negative blood group is very rare and if at all there is some problem to get the blood and to look after the health it will be a bit problematic so these things you have to consider so if both are negative the chances are more if one is negative and one is positive okay is better so there are so many such angles that you have to consider but at the time of matching the bride and the groom if i am right these things are not considered at all there are so many other things when i say attitude and aptitude it was in a nutshell what i was telling how to match their attitudes and aptitudes that's also another very important thing okay one person has got lot of faith and belief in god another person doesn't believe it you will set up a match for them there will be lot of discussions and disturbances in their married life they cannot continue as good companions one person is very much interested in studying in learning the other person is not so much interested in learning one person loves music the other person doesn't love music so much one person is interested in traveling the other person is not interested in traveling one person is very generous they want to share whatever they have got the other person is not generous but is a miser they want to hold on to whatever they have got one person wants to lead a simple life the other person wants to lead a luxurious life you see there are so many things one person has got certain habits vices which disturb their health it spoil their health the other person doesn't have it that's a mismatch one person thinks of self and the society the other person thinks of only self more selfish it will not make a good pair you see like this if we go on endlessly one person becomes very angry immediately and the other person is very tolerant okay this could be a good match <laughs> this could be a good match because one person is very haughty the other person is calm and cool so to match all these things one person loves animals and pets the other person doesn't love he says it's a bird why we should have it is you are looking at your cat <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay there are so many such things you have to consider one person has got that service mind they will be first in attending to the problems of others but the other person is so conservative so reserved they don't want to mix with people they make a very bad mismatch there are so many such things so have to analyze each and every element as far as possible and find out to what extent they are compatible and this is more like a scientific psychological appraisal rather than a blind matching of two pieces of paper called horoscopes that will not work that will not work all this horoscope i am speaking only in terms of indian context elsewhere if i am right they don't yeah. go for these horoscopes and other things now they go for is dating and try to understand but unfortunately that physical relationship is involved in the dating now that is the negative aspect of it so we have to find a balance between all these things and as far as possible we should look into their lifestyle look into their outlook to life look into their health look into their attitudes and aptitudes and considering all these things if 50 plus or 60% matches that's an excellent match what about the other 40% they have to bridge it later there is no other way they have to bridge it later but both should have that mind that mentality that attitude to bridge it and make their companionship or friendship more pleasing and more tolerable and more enjoyable that they have to do it is a responsibility of the both so all this knowledge has to be given in detail and there is a prerequisite only then we get into giving them vivaha samskara
So all these things, unless we consider it, we will not be able to build a strong Grihasthashrama. And that strong Grihasthashrama is required because that's the base for the other three ashramas. If the base itself is shaky, then Brahmacharya Ashrama cannot prosper, Vanaprastha cannot prosper, Sanyasa Ashrama cannot prosper. So if all the four are in doodrums, all the four are in trouble, then the whole society will collapse. To build up a strong society, we need a strong base and that strong base is his Grihasthashrama. That is the way we have to look at it and that is at the focus and we concentrate on it and see that it becomes a strong pillar supporting the other three ashramas. If this is a strong pillar and if it can support the other three, yes, the whole society will be strong. The whole society will improve from generation to generation and there will be no question of degeneration. And the health of the society improves, the knowledge of the society improves, the strength of the society improves. As a result, every individual in this human society will be capable of continuing their spiritual pursuit to the satisfaction of oneself. That's a very, very important. That is the ultimate goal of human life. We will create an environment where it is feasible, where it is convenient for a person to pursue their spiritual goals. That is the environment that we have to create. And that is the motivation that we have to give to our future generation. We have to do it. We have to motivate our younger generation to understand all these things. If there is a slip anywhere, if there is a slip anywhere, as I was referring to that uh, physical relationship in the dating and other things there, or pre-marital relationships, mainly physical, if such things are there, they will work as a hindrance for the spiritual progress. And that's a very important thing. There should be complete control over sensual pleasure. Having control over sensual pleasures is very, very important for the spiritual pursuit. Because the sensual pleasures are like uh, pulling us down and our spiritual pursuit is like moving up. So more we are pulled down, less we can progress. So you have to be very careful about those elements which pull us down. But it doesn't mean, I repeat, it doesn't mean that we should not have sensual pleasures at all. Sensual pleasures are required. Sensual pleasures are required, but how, how much, to what extent, in what way is the very important thing that we have to consider. Now here, there is one more discussion. That also we have to understand before we move forward. Many people say, okay, I can call them as very, very orthodox. Very, very orthodox. So what they say is, the relationship between husband and wife has to take place only to beget children. There is no purpose of begetting children, they have to be separate. There is no physical relationship at all. Because the purpose of physical relationship is to beget children. So this is one point of view. On the other side they say, children are immaterial, it is enjoyment, it is physical relationship that gives us a lot of pleasure and enjoying life like that is the goal of life. Forget about all other things. So one side it is very very orthodoxical, another side is very very animal-like. But for a human life, it is some balancing point between these two. It's neither animal-like nor too orthodoxical. Because this physical relationship has got not only a physical bearing, but also mental effect. That is, this coming together physically between husband and wife will give them a lot of peace and solace. They bring them together and a sort of a companionship and a sort of a friendship is established between them. So, the purpose of husband and wife living together is not just for children, but also giving solace to others. That is, husband to wife and wife to husband. So we have got two purposes there. One is they two becoming good friends, they two becoming good companions, they two being compassionate to one another, they two giving solace to one another. That's one side. Other side is begetting children and that is the balancing point. 
So we make use of this relationship for these two purposes. That is to pacify one another, number one, to beget children on the second one. So if these two purposes are not there, if these two purposes are not there, then the relationship becomes beyond limit and it crosses the boundary and a lot of problems will present in. So these two are in focus and then take care of these two elements, yes, that relationship between husband and wife will be very ideal and very realistic. Now for the second one, that is to begin children. We have discussed so many health aspects and other things. That is one. And there are many other preparations also to begin children. That we are discussing in Garbhadana Samskara. That is the very first one. So Garbhadana Samskara, they educate the would-be parents. And tell them that you have to practice your life, you have to frame your life like this, you have to trim your life like this. As a result, you will have good progeny. So many things are there. Then the other side, when you are speaking of the pacifying element, the soothing element in a relationship, yes, it will happen only when the mental aspects are bridged and made compatible. It's not just physical. Mere physical, okay, that's animal-like. That's right, we are not denying it. But in case of human beings, it's physical plus mental. Only when mentally they are attracted to one another, only mentally when they are like friends, only when mentally they like one another, love one another, yes. That pacifying element, that soothing element, that enjoying the company of one another will happen, not otherwise. So both should, take, should be taken care of. This is another uh, angle that we have to understand in uh, knowing what is Vivaha Samskara. Most of the things I have covered, starting from age, to the purpose of uh, this Vivaha Samskara. Now, what all I have said in this Vivaha Samskara, it has been put into a capsule forum. It has been put into a capsule forum and that is the uh, cream of this whole Viva Samskara and that you call it as Saptapadi. Yeah. Saptapadi. In that Saptapadi, what all I have discussed so far, all these things are put in a capsule forum. And before we understand what this Saptapadi is, Saptapadi is the essence of the whole Viva Samskara. And before that, before the Saptapadi, we have got Two very important things to understand. One is Panik Grahana, another one is Laja Homa. Two things Panik Grahana and Laja Homa. Panik Grahana is a woe given by the groom to the bride. The groom says, This is what I am. In future, in our Grahastha Shama, these are the responsibilities I take. And this is how I am going to lead the life in Grahastha Shama. So he gives a lot of promises and he takes certain woes. In response to it, the bride gives so many woes and tells the groom, I also in that Nirasashama lead the life like this. And that is called as Laja Homa. Panigrahana woes given by the groom to the bride. Laja Homa woes given by the bride to the groom and Saptapadi, that is the acme, that is the highest level, where both of them come to an understanding that these shall be our guiding principles in our Vivaha Samskara, in our future Grahasthashama. So we shall be guided by these things. So following these things, we shall make ourselves happy, we shall beget good children and we shall make our life purposeful physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually. So, before we go to Saptapadi, a few things about Manigrahana, a few things about Laja Homa, and then going into Saptapadi. There are so many other uh, intermediary rituals. I am not going into the details of it. Every ritual has got its own implication, has got its own contribution to achieving this. That is fine. That we will see a little later. The very important thing, Panigrahana, very important thing, no. that is Laja Homa and finally Saptapadi. So these three things we will discuss uh, 
uh, in future. I think I have uh, sufficiently given some uh, introduction to these things. So if you got any questions, if you got any doubts and clarifications, yes, you are free to ask it. Uh, so for the day, we'll call it a day for the at this stage, and we'll discuss about it in the next session. Okay.